Good evening, everyone, and I'm delighted to welcome Philip Hentcher, who's furthest away from me, Bethan Roberts, and Damien Barr in the middle, to the Charleston Festival. I'm sure you all know by now that Edmund White, who was originally scheduled to appear in this event, suffered a stroke in the States a couple of weeks ago, uh, two or three weeks ago. I gather he's making a good recovery, although clearly he can't travel. Uh, so we're enormously appreciative of the fact that Philip Hentcher stepped into the breach really at very, very short notice. Um, and we're very pleased to be able to host him and help him to celebrate the wonderful reviews for his new novel, Scenes from Early Life. Philip Hentcher is one of our most versatile literary figures. He's written short stories, novels, criticism, and even libretti. He's unusual in combining traditional narrative, narrative and characterization, sorry, characterization with authorial flamboyance and playfulness, relishing pastiche, illusion, and sleight of hand. His novels often capture the spirit of the age, especially the northern clemency, which followed two Sheffield families through the Thatcher years. His most recent novel, The King of the Badgers, also catches the mood of the time, lifting the lid off a community at the center of a tragedy. His current novel, Scenes from Early Life, is a departure, part fiction, part factual. It's an attempt to do justice to the life of his Bangladeshi husband and muse and turbulent history of that country. Bethan Roberts has written short stories, novels, and a radio play. Her second novel, The Good Plain Cook, was serialized on BBC Radio 4's book at bedtime. Her current book, My Policeman, is loosely based on aspects of Ian e. Forster's complex love life and his relationship with his longtime companion transposed to Brighton in the repressive 50s. Damien Barr, who's our chair for this session, is a writer, columnist and playwright and creator and host of the infamous Shoreditch House, Shoreditch House Literary Salon. He's currently writing his own memoir about growing up in the Thatcher years. So I'm going to hand over to Damien, who will guide us through the rest of this session. Thanks, Diana. Um, thanks, Diana, and thank you all. Can you hear all right? Is this good? Good, you can. Worth checking, always. You wouldn't want to miss any gems. I should just add, actually, I did finish my book last week, Diana. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Yeah, yeah, I haven't, fin haven't edited it yet or shown it to anyone, but it is done. Um, so I've got two fantastic guests tonight um, who've written two novels which seem on the surface incredible. They are very different, but there are lots of themes that connect the two of them to do with identity, to do with place, to do with otherness. Um, and I'm very excited to have them both here. And I want to start off by asking Bethan to read for us a bit, because as you're our local talent, um, uh, about, about Brighton, I think, this bit is. Yes. I'll stand up. I'll stand up, just in case you can't see me down there. Mm. Um, Uh, just to introduce the book a little bit, um, My Policeman is a novel about two people who are in love with the same man. Uh, one is Marion, who's a young school teacher, and she develops an early crush on Tom Burgess, who is a sea swimmer, a trainee policeman, and a kind of all-round blonde bombshell. Uh, the other is Patrick, who's slightly older, much more urbane and experienced than Marion. And because the book is set in the 50s and in Brighton, uh, both characters are unable to express their desires quite as fully as they would like. And the novel kind of explores the consequences of that. Um, now, in this section, um, I should tell you that much of the book is made up of Marion's telling of the story of her relationship with Tom. And she tells this story to Patrick, who many years after they first meet is being nursed by Marion, um, having suffered a stroke. And in this section, Marion's describing the first time that Tom attempts to teach her to swim in the sea. Um, and this kind of marks the beginning of their rather odd courtship. And uh, she's standing on the front um, at Brighton, waiting for Tom to appear. I set myself a little challenge. Could I avoid looking towards the palace pier the way I knew he would come? Fixing my eyes on the water, I imagined him rising from the sea like Neptune, half draped in bladderack, his neck studded with barnacles, a crab hanging from his hair. He'd remove the creature and fling it aside as he shrugged off the waves. 
he'd make his way noiselessly up the beach towards me despite the pebbles and would take me in his arms and carry me back to wherever it was he'd come from. I started to giggle at myself and only the sight of Tom, the real living, breathing, land-walking Tom, stopped me. He was wearing a black t-shirt and had a faded brown towel slung over his shoulders. On seeing me, he gave a brief wave and pointed back the way he'd come. Club's got a changing room, he called. This way, under the arches. And before I could reply, he walked off in the direction he was pointing. I remained standing by the milk bar, still imagining Neptune Tom coming out of the sea, dripping salt and fish, spraying the shore with brine and sea creatures from some deep, dark world beneath. Without turning round, he shouted, Haven't got all day! And I followed him, hurrying behind and saying nothing, until we reached a metal door in the arches. Then he turned and looked at me. You did bring a hat, didn't you? Of course. He unlocked the door and pushed it open. Come down when you're ready then, I'm going in. I went inside. The place was like a cave, damp and chalky smelling, with paint peeling from the ceiling and rusty pipes running along one wall. The floor was still wet, the air clinging, and I shuddered. I hung my cardigan on a peg at the back of the room and unbuttoned my dress. I'd graduated from the red bathing costume I'd worn that day at the Lido years ago and I'd bought a bright green costume covered in swirly patterns from Peter Robinson's. I'd been quite pleased with the effect when I'd tried it on in the shop. The cups of the bra were constructed from something that felt like rubber and a short pleated skirt was attached to the waist. But here in the cavern of the changing room there was no mirror on the wall just a list of swimming races with names and dates I noticed Tom had won the last one. So after pulling the flowered cap on my head and folding my dress on the bench, I went outside, wearing my towel around me. The sun was higher now and the sea had taken on a dull glitter. Squinting, I saw Tom's head bobbing in the waves. I watched as he emerged from the sea. Standing in the shallows, he flicked his hair back, and rubbed his hands up and down his thighs, as if trying to get some warmth back into his flesh. Almost toppling and having to grab my towel to keep it from falling to the ground, I managed to walk halfway down the beach in my sandals. The crunch and crack of the pebbles convinced me that this scene was real, that this was actually happening to me. I was approaching the sea, and I was approaching Tom, who was wearing only a pair of blue striped trunks. He came up to greet me, catching my elbow to steady me on the stones. Nice cap, he said, with a half smirk, and then glancing down at my sandals, those will have to come off. I know that. I tried to keep my voice light and humorous like his. In those days it was rare, wasn't it, Patrick, for Tom's voice to become what you might call serious. There was always a lot of up and down in it, a delicacy, almost a musicality. No doubt that's how you'd heard it and as though you couldn't quite believe anything he said. Over the years, his voice lost some of its musicality, partly, I think, in reaction to what happened to you, but even now, occasionally, it's like there's a laugh behind his words, just waiting to sneak out. OK, we'll go in together. Don't think about it too much. Hold on to me. We'll just get you used to the water. It's not too cold today. Quite warm, in fact. It's always warm at this time of year. It's very calm, so it's all looking good. Nothing to worry about. It's also very shallow here, so I'll have to wade out a bit. Ready? It was the most I'd ever heard him say, and I was a bit taken aback by his brisk professionalism. He used the same smooth tone I did when trying to coax my pupils to read the next sentence of a book without stumbling. I realised Tom would make a good policeman. He had the knack of sounding as though he were in control. Have you done this before? I asked taught people to swim. In the army and at Sandgate, some of the boys have never been in the water. I helped them get their heads wet. He gave a short laugh. Despite Tom's assurances to the contrary, the water was extremely cold. As I went in, my whole body clenched and the breath was sucked out of me. The stones drove into my feet and the water chilled my blood immediately, leaving my skin pimpled, my teeth chattering. I tried to concentrate my energy on the point where Tom's fingers met my elbow. I told myself this contact was enough to make it all worthwhile. Tom, of course, made no sign of noticing the iciness of the water or the sharpness of the stones. As he walked in, the sea rocking at his thighs, I thought how springy his body was. He was leading me and so was slightly ahead. This allowed me to look at him properly. 
and as I did so, I managed to steady my juddering jaw and breathe through the cold that was smashing into my body with each step. So much Tom in the waves, springing through the water. So much flesh, Patrick, and all of it shining on that bright September morning. He let the water splash up his chest, still holding my elbow. Everything was moving, and Tom moved too. He moved with the sea, or against it, as he wished, whereas I felt the movement too late, and only just managed to retain my balance. He looked back. You all right? Because he smiled at me, I nodded. How's that feel? he asked. How, Patrick, could I begin to answer him? Fine, I said, a bit cold. Good, you're doing well. Now we're going to do the tiniest bit of swimming. All I want you to do is follow me, and when we're deep enough, let your feet lift off the bottom, and I'll hold you up, just so you can feel what it's like. Is that all right? Was that all right? His face was so serious when he asked me this, it was hard to keep from laughing. How could I object to the prospect of Tom holding me? We waded further out, and the water took my thighs and waist, touching every part of me with its freezing tongue. Then when the sea was up to my armpits and beginning to splash at my mouth, Tom put a hand flat on my stomach and pressed. Feet off the bottom, he commanded. I needn't tell you, Patrick, that I obeyed, utterly mesmerised by the huge strength of that hand on my stomach and by Tom's eyes, blue and changing like the sea on mine. I let my feet lift and was borne upward by the salt and the rocking motion of the water. Tom's hand was there, a steady platform, I tried to keep my head above the waves, and for a second, everything balanced perfectly on Tom's flat hand, and I heard him say, Good, you're almost swimming. I turned to nod at him. I wanted to see his face, to smile at him, and have him smile back, proud teacher, best pupil. And then the sea came up over my face, and I couldn't see. In my panic, I lost his hand. Water rushed backwards through my nose, my arms and legs whipped about wildly, trying to find something to grip, some solid substance to anchor me, and I felt something soft and giving beneath my foot. Tom's groin, I knew it even then, and I pushed off from that and managed to come up for a breath of air, heard Tom shouting something, then as I went under again, his arms were around me, gripping my waist and pulling me free of the water, so my breasts were nigh on in his face, and I was still struggling, gasping the air, and it wasn't until I heard him say, You're all right, I've got you, in a slightly annoyed tone, that I stopped fighting and clung to his shoulders, my flowered bathing cap flapping loose at the side of my head like a piece of skin. He carried me back to the shore in silence, and when he deposited me on the beach, I couldn't look at him. Take a moment, he said. Sorry, I gasped. Get your breath back, then we'll try again. Again? I looked up at him. You are joking. He ran a finger along the length of his nose. No, he said. I'm not joking. You have to get back in. I gazed down the beach. The clouds were gathering now and the day hadn't warmed up at all. He held out a hand to me. Come on, he said. Just once. He smiled. I'll even forgive you for kicking me where you did. How could I refuse? <laughs> I, th I think given that he'd just been kicked in the balls, he did really well just to be slightly annoyed. Um, but I suppose it was the 1950s and people were, you know, calmer <laughs> then, better manners, I suppose. Um, so you, um, we, we have an introduction to two of the characters and you're talking to, to a third, um, mm. to Tom and Mary and, and Patrick. But as, as we mentioned at the beginning, they're based on three real people. Mm. Um, tell us about them and, and when you kind of encountered their story. Okay, um, well, I was kind of looking around for something to write about after my last book, um, and um, my, for my last book I'd sort of taken uh, some aspects of Peggy Guggenheim's life, um, very famous millionaires, art collector and eccentric, and um, I'd kind of found that really interesting and, and kind of fertile, you know, to kind of see how fact and fiction uh, clash and what, you know, and what becomes of that. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, maybe I can do that again. You know, that, that was quite the nice. The last time, or Yeah, you know, why not? And, uh, and so I, you know, I've loved um, Ian Forster for, for a long time, and um, I was kind of aware, you know, of his personal life. 
Um, and I thought, well, I'll just read um, um, a, a biography of, of Forster and kind of see if anything comes up that's interesting. And I don't think I was ever really seriously thinking, well, I, I will write a fictionalised version of E.M. Forster because that would be just incredibly cheeky. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and you know, the responsibility of it, I think, would have been far too heavy. So, you know, when I read about this story of um, Forster and um, his lover, Bob Buckingham, um, they met when uh, Forster was in his uh, early 50s and Bob was in his late 20s. Bob was a policeman. Um, and they had a 40-year relationship. And, you know, w one of the things... One Bob of was a married policeman. Well, that's what I was yeah. going to say. One of the things that was remarkable about that was that Bob remained married throughout that time. But even more remarkable was, you know, as, as the, the biography had it, was that uh, May, who was Bob's wife, was the one who was there at the end of Forster's life and kind of at his bedside holding his hand. And I kind of thought, well, you know, how the hell does that come about, that, that you know, that, that a woman would, would be there at the end of um, her husband's lover's life holding his hand? And so that was kind of what, what sparked the book, really. And I, uh, you know, and I, I wanted to write about that triangle. Um, but I think I, I always knew that it wouldn't be... You know, it wouldn't be Forster and Bob and no. May. It would be. Well, no, they, I mean, it is, a, it is a novel. They are the inspiration. You know, there there yes. are things about that are that are different yeah. and, and and similar. I mean, obviously, you know, the the Brighton is one of the key aspects of it. It happens in a particular place at a particular time. But um, you mentioned triangle, and we were talking um, on the way over here about the relationship. With, you know, the three sides of the triangle. Mm. They're not equal, are they? It's quite. Mm. You know, there's. You know, um, uh, uh, Bob is having sex with Patrick. Um, with Forster, I'm confusing them already. <laughs> um, but, but, but you know, poor, poor May slash Marion is, is is nowhere in that, is she? And she apparently, he apparently said that, that he didn't know that Forster was gay towards the end of his life. Mm. Isn't that right? Yes, that's right. Mm. 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 Apparently. Apparently. Yes. yes, that's what he so said. So what did they think they were doing on all those nights <laughs> then, I wonder? I don't know. You know, maybe just having good conversations. I don't know. I mean, it, you know, I think that the impression I get of, of, of the real relationship is that it, it kind of functioned because no one talked about it, you know, and and so you know Marion didn't talk about it. Uh, May yeah. didn't talk about You're it. You're doing it now. I'm doing it. <laughs> and um, you know, and and that was how it kind of managed to to carry on somehow. Mm. That, that you know that they they all knew, yeah. but they weren't going to say. They just no. didn't talk about it. Um, and so you, you talked there about Brighton. I mean, we both we both live in Brighton, and it's mm. recognisable, but it's it's completely different. Mm. Um, one of the things that you said in the book which was really interesting is that um, the Brighton, for all its cosmopolitan airs, is a small town. Mm. You said that then, and I think it's broad, still true now, isn't it? Well, that's kind of me saying that, isn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah. I think that is true, really. Um, you know, we won't talk about Brighton and Hove. So oh, obviously, that's no. a city. <laughs> that's no. But yeah, no, Brighton is a, is a small town. I think. You know, and it, and that and that I suppose was quite useful as a setting, you know, for the book because it gives you that kind of enclosed space in a way. Yeah, I mean, there are interesting characters there as well because there are there are a number of gay bars, but they're not really gay bars. There's there's the Argyle and there's the Spotted Dog. Now, were they real places? Yeah, the spotted yeah, no, dog, they're I'm absolutely. Sure heard, uh, yeah, absolutely, they they are real places. Um, uh, the Spotted Dog was on Middle Street, and um, uh, the Greyhound is now the Fish Bowl. Um, if you know that. Oh yeah, I don't know yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. And um, Still a but, but only upstairs, but yeah. <laughs> only upstairs in the in the Greyhound slash Fish Bowl. Um, only upstairs on the first Thursday of every yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a sense in which the world that that's, that they're operating in is secret, and I think something mm. that's something that touched me. Um, you know, as, as a gay man growing up in the 80s, it mm. was, you know, the age of consent was still still 21, and you still felt in. You know what you were doing was wrong. You were in danger of the law. People finding out, teachers, parents, that you know, that all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. That's still the case, even mm -hmm. though the law has changed. Mm -hmm. But this was actually much more mm -hmm. serious. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you know, you get this. You know, he could lose his job. Mm -hmm. He could lose the the place that he lives, and indeed, he does lose his job, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, he could lose his his liberty, really, um, and you know, and his whole life because you know, all, all, all your friends, you know, might just suddenly not be your friends, you know, and mm. and your family. Um, and yeah, you know that's obviously a huge pressure in the book, and something that I was very interested in and wanted to write about. But you know that that thing about Brighton being a different place is quite interesting because I think 
in lots of ways, you know, Brighton, Brighton has always been a place where, you know, people went to do things where mm. they couldn't do, which they couldn't do elsewhere. You yeah. know, it's always had that about it. And, and actually, you know, when I was doing the research for the book, I read a book called Daring Hearts, which is a wonderful um, book of kind of memoirs of, of, of um, um, gay men and women who were in Brighton in, in the 50s. And, you know, you do get a very, a very big sense of Brighton, you know, being a kind of place of liberation, despite, you know, all the, all the constrictions that, that are there. Mm. And that kind of gives it a bit of a special quality, really, that, you know, it has the secrecy, but it's also, you know, a very, um, you know, kind of libertine place. Yeah. It's interesting, I mean, you're, you're saying that Patrick, you know, um, does does lose his, his job for reasons we'll, <coughs> we'll reveal right now. But he no does, spoilers. He does, he, does, he does lose his job. And I was when I was researching you, you also lost a, a job in si not similar circumstances, but, um, but <laughs> it, it mm. seemed to me that there were sort of tinges of homophobia mm. around, around that, and that was much more recently. No, 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 I, no, I... I should have been sacked. I thought you were sacked. I was. I should have been sacked. Oh, you, I deserved, think, you agree that you should have been sacked? I deserved to well, be I sacked. Well, I didn't ask you if you I just wanted to make sure you no. had been, first of all. You had yes. been, and you agree. Yes. So there's no tribunal. It's fine. No, 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 that's fine. I loved being sacked. It was wonderful. It was one of the happiest moments of my life. Um, I think everyone should be sacked sometime, at some time in their life, really, because after that, nothing anybody does can hold any terror for you, because you know that you've faced... Uh, the, the, the clerk of the House of Commons, and he says to you, did you write this? And he put, gives you a piece of paper where you're going on in an insane way about whether Michael Portillo has sexy legs or not. <laughs> this is an interview yes. that he gave, I should add. And so, um, and so I said, yes. And then it occurred to me that for the next 10 minutes, for once in my life, anything I said would have no consequences whatsoever. <laughs> I was just going to be sacked. It was lovely. I, I, it's kind of yes. liberating experience. But they were quite right to sack me. I was I was hopeless at the job, and um, and I did I did write a scandalous novel, which I shouldn't have done. I was totally in breach of contract. But uh, yes, Jeffrey Archer seems to have got away with it for quite a while. <laughs> well, uh, luckily, I'm a much better writer than Jeffrey Archer. But. Uh, <laughs> um, we touched just then um, on the, the, the sense of fear that the, the, the central characters experience in the book, or a few of them do anyway, and it really is a culture of, you know, you're not sure if your landlady or your, your colleagues are going to grass you up, and you, you don't want to be seen having people coming and going from, from your house, and that, that, you know, that was, that was Brighton then. Um, and then you move to the world that you depict in your novel, and there's also a, a sense of, growing sense of fear all the way throughout it. Um, people with, but it's also about identity, isn't it? Um, do you want to tell us about that? Well, well, what, they, what they fear, okay. yes. Okay. Yes, and it's. Um, um, it's uh, sometimes you don't know where a novel comes from, or well, it's just a little um, glimpse. And um, but this one, it was all too clear where it had come from, and um, it was uh, my husband going on and on and on um, over the course of ten years. Um, he's a very, very good storyteller, uh, my husband, and um, and I love hearing about other people's families. So um, he used to. He I'd, over the years, I just heard a lot of um, stories about his uh, growing up um, just after the uh, the foundation of Bangladesh. Um, and about his um, his multiple aunts and his his family, and I would just go go on, go on, tell me more, tell me more. Um, and uh, whenever we went to a publishing party, he would always say afterwards. I was talking to Nicholas, my editor, and Nicholas has um, has said that um, I ought to write um, I ought to write my memoirs. Um, and but he's a very he's a very important and busy person. My husband, he's a he's a lawyer for the United Nations, so he was never going to write his own memoirs. Um, and also, he's probably um, acquired a sense that I have about uh, writing your own memoirs, which um, I've always thought was a slightly common thing to do. Um, <laughs> I think you ought to wait until somebody writes your biography. Really. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so anyway, he uh, he went on telling me these stories, and then um, one day I suddenly thought, I'll, I'm going to write his memoirs. I'm going to write a uh, memoir in um, in the first person. And actually, when I started writing it, I thought it was just going to be um, sto comic stories of, uh, of childhood. He's got lots of great stories about his pet chicken and uh, uh, what Nada or Auntie did when uh, at his great grandmother's funeral and so on. And um, 
Um, but then I suddenly realized that he was born just before the War of Independence, which was a savage, savage civil war. And really the point at which I noticed that I could write this novel was he told this story about um, what happened when he was a baby. And um, they all went, his, his parents and his aunts and cousins and everything, went to live uh, during the course of the war in his grandfather's house in Dhaka. And he was the only baby in the family at that time. And his grandfather gave instructions that whatever happened, this baby must not be allowed to cry. Because um, the Pakistani troops against whom the nation was fighting for independence were roaming in the street outside. And if they heard a baby crying, they would know there were young women in the house. And if they knew there were young women in the house, they would break in and rape and murder them. So his aunts were deputed to pass him from one to the other, feeding him yogurt ceaselessly for the, over the course of uh, he becomes nine a fat months. Baby. He becomes a very fat baby, yes. So that was the point at which the, the novel started. Shall I read a little yes, bit from it? I'm going, I'm going to read a little bit. It's quite a jolly book, actually, but uh, I'm going to read a... Um, I'm going to read a violent bit, I think. And um, it was the first day of the, the Civil War. And what happened was that uh, my parents-in-law, um, they waited until the, a curfew was lifted. And then they took, um, then they uh, departed from their house to my grandparents-in-law's house. Um, the, uh, the narrator is, uh, is is the baby. Where are you going? My mother said, coming out of the back room with the baby in her arms. My father was going downstairs. We have to get to father's house. We can't stay here. They're going to kill us. No, you and the children mustn't stay, my father said, carrying on his way downstairs quite calmly. You must go while you can. But how? My mother said. How are we to get a message to them? There's no telephone. From downstairs, my father's voice drifted up. Pack a bag for you and the children, he called. Do it quickly, just what you need. Nothing seemed clear to my mother, but she did what she was told. She quietened the children, pretending as best she could that this was all some great adventure, and told Zahid, my brother, that he must make sure the others made no noise and stayed exactly where they were in the back rooms of the house. Her main terror was that a child of hers, standing at the front window of the upper story, would be seen by a passing soldier and shot for no reason. And then a miracle happened, a familiar engine noise in the street outside. She hesitatingly went herself to the front window. There, below in the street, was the red Vauxhall car of my grandfather's. Rustum, my grandfather's driver, got out hurriedly, looking quickly to left and right. He left the car's engine running and the driver's door open. He banged on the gate of the house, but my mother was already taking her half-packed bags, one in each hand, and calling for the children. Behind her, Zahid and the girls were following, their faces pale. Where is Sadi? my mother said. I had been left sleeping peacefully in the back bedroom. Go, 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 she said to Sushmita, my sister. Go and pick up your little brother. Do you think you can carry him? Sushmita thought she could, and the five of us went swiftly downstairs. From the flat downstairs, my father emerged, and sweeping us along, brought up the rear. My mother dropped the suitcase on the ground and fumblingly opened the bolt of the front gate. Go on, go on, my father said impatiently, and between them, he and Rustum bundled my mother and the four children into the back of the red Vauxhall. Quite suddenly, the back door of the car was shut. Rustum got into the driver's seat. Go on, my father said. I shall come along later today. From the outside, he banged on the roof to tell Rustum to go. What is it? Where are you going? My mother mouthed from the back of the car, but it was too late. My father had turned and gone back inside the house, shutting and bolting the gate behind him. And again, my mother, secure in the back of the red Vauxhall, began to scream. This time, I awoke and responding to my mother's noise, began to wail myself. She had had no idea my father would not come with us until he had shut the door of the car and banged a practical, necessary farewell on the roof. 
It had been only 15 minutes since the lifting of the curfew for five hours was announced on the radio. At one o'clock, it would fall again. Nana, my grandfather, must have ordered Rustum to go straight out and fetch us. Elephant Road was only a ten-minute drive from my grandfather's house. It was quite a different sort of place. There were small shops selling groceries and household necessities. It was, in normal times, a pleasant, busy thoroughfare. There was a large barter store, which added, acted as a landmark in Dhaka, and other shoe shops, carpet sellers, hardware emporia, with rows of plastic bowls and aluminium pans hanging outside, tea stalls, confectioners, copper showpieces, show barbers, chemists and shawani merchants. I slept peacefully through the short journey from Elephant Road to Nana's house in Danmondi. <coughs> My mother, brother and sisters would never forget what they saw. The windows of Sushmita's favourite confectioner, the one with the best jalapi, the one where she loved to hang around and watch the expert confectioner piping a map of the world, a round Arabic signature, a piece of magical writing in the seething oil and let it rise. The windows of that shop were smashed. Inside, there was broken glass and spattered confectionery, milk and flour and sugar thrown like abstract fantasies across the oil-soaked floor. A house was on fire, its gates hanging from their hinges. The hardware shops had given up their contents like vomiting beasts. Across the street, pans and tools and plastic goods were strewn and crushed, and there was a rickshaw turned over, lying in the street abandoned. There's blood on it. There's blood on it, Sushmita screamed. There was, and underneath it was lying some kind of large packet, slumped and crushed. Don't look, Rustum said. We'll soon be nice and safe. But they had to look. Down a side street, there was a platoon of military lounging against the cab of a lorry and paying no attention to the shop further down that was on fire, the gusts of flame and black smoke pouring into the street like foul, fragrant blooms. It must have been one of the shops that made a good living renting out splendid garments and silver and thread of gold to guests at weddings, all that glitter and light consumed in a moment. And one of the shop's mannequins, no, more than one, had been dragged out of the shop and thrown into the road, lying there in an awkward position. Perhaps the person who had done it had wanted to steal the outfits from the mannequins because they were quite bare, the arms raised, wax-like, in the mud of the street, and more blood covering one mannequin's chest and running into a black stain on the road. But it was no mannequin. Don't look. Rustum said again. Sushmita would never forget that sight. A man lying in the road, his throat cut, his fat little legs raised as if in an attempt to run, and then she was sick. Please, Rustum, my mother said when they were drawing up outside grandfather's house. Please, just leave us here. Go back for my husband. It's too dangerous, Rustum said. He wouldn't come. He'll come later. I can't go and make him get in the car. If he didn't come, it's because he has things now that he has to do. He has to come, my mother said, but now Rustum was out of the car and opening the gate. Rustam ignored him, and between him, Nana, Nani, and Boromama, big uncle, who had all come out of the house, my mother and all of us were bundled together into safety. The children, Shiri and the baby, came through the glass-framed porch at the side of the house and were propelled by the servants and others along the passageway and into the large salon at the back of the house. My mother was screaming in terror, screaming for her husband, and Rustam explained how it was that my father had been left behind. Have mercy, my grandmother said, and led my mother away. My sisters were handed over to the ayah, who took them upstairs to clean them up and make them respectable again. My brother, Zahid, who had observed everything in silence, went over to the aunts, who greeted him politely, as if he were a grown-up and paying a visit. In 20 minutes, the noises of grief from Nani's room had subsided a little, and Zahid had found an interesting book to occupy himself with in a corner. For the moment... I was sleeping peacefully, swaddled in my blanket, guarded by Dahlia, auntie. The gates were shut and bolted. Outside, in the Danmondi street, the noises of battle, the crackle that a house on fire makes, began to return. Terrible, terrible things happen in the next few pages. I mean, I found parts of it quite... Quite, quite hard to bear. Yeah. Um, how did how did so mm -hmm. Saadi is based on based on your husband and how did he those is my he is your husband. He so why husband. didn't you just do a memoir? Uh, 
But why didn't you just tell? Why didn't? Why didn't you? Why is he a character of Sardi rather oh. than Zav? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what the difference is. The name. That, that, um, that's his name. That's his name. Okay, that is his name. That is okay, his name. Sorry, in okay. uh, Bengali's, um, in um, it's it's terribly complicated Bengali names. They call each other by their family relationship. So you wouldn't say you wouldn't call your sister by the, by her name. You'd say hello, big sister, or hello, small sister, or if they have an official name which is what they put on mm. forms, um, which is Zaved Mahmud in his case. And then they have a name which they use within the family. So his name within the family is Sadi. Oh, OK. But it's terribly complicated. There's a, um, there's a character in the book um, which is um, um, Little Uncle. And his, um, he, I can call him Little Uncle because I'm, if I'm family now, but I'm not allowed to call him Pultu. And his real name on a form is Syed. It's, it's, it's too complicated. I did spend a lot of I'm time sorry, flicking backwards and forwards and trying it's to all, check. It all, makes, it all makes perfect sense in the book. It, 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 it does, but I, there, was, there was that fair amount of flicking, so I, un, I understand that now. Okay, <laughs> okay sorry. Um, so, so, so he, but he was a baby at the, at the time, yeah. and so these are stories that are told to him as yes. he's growing up that, you, that you've told and that are, that are, that are yes. now being retold. Yes. How does, how does he feel about your version of those events? Well, he loves it. I mean, anything he didn't love, I took took out. You know, it's uh, it's uh, this had to be a uh, a consensual thing from the start. The one thing that I did, I didn't let him read it while I was writing it, because I knew that things would become become clear. But at the end, he uh, he read it and said, "Could you take that bit out?" And um, but more startlingly, um, the, um, the 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 aunts have started to read it now, um, oh, really? and I didn't consult them at all, um, and um, and they 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 love it so far. I mean, there's a lot of aunts to get through. There's uh, there's seven there's seven aunts. So um, the the one who loves it is uh, is Nadira, who's a, a big presence in the book. Is which, she the one who goes to Sheffield? Yeah, she's the one who goes to Sheffield, which just goes to show you can put people in books by name, so long as every time they come in. You, you say Nadira came in looking extraordinarily beautiful and elegant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't. She doesn't mind. She kept saying, "How does she?" He knows me so well. He knows me so well. Um, and how how has? I mean, we were talking about about how Brighton has changed slightly. Some things. I mean, big things are the same. The ship hotel is the same. The pier is the same. Although you now don't have to pay to go on it. The sea, of course, never changes. But how how has the city changed? How has Dhaka changed from 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 then till now? Because you talk about it a bit in the notes afterwards, but. Well, uh, that was one of the things that um, that Zav kept um, kept having to tell me about because, of course, I wasn't I wasn't in I, I didn't know Dakar in the the 1970s. Um, the the main thing that I kept having to remember was that there was no traffic, and if anyone's been to to Dhaka, you know that it's it's unbelievable. You know, you can you can sit in you can sit in a traffic jam for two hours and advan have advanced 200 yards at the end of it. Mm. It's um, so I kept um, I kept quite enjoying writing. Um, he uh, he got in he got in a, a, a rickshaw. Ten minutes later, he got out, knowing that it's like a, a mile away, and it just couldn't it just couldn't happen now. Yeah. And I think actually that's one of the things that people enjoy. Um, I think sort of in essentials, um, I think that um, I think that the nation has been through uh, an enormous amount, but at the end of it, there's something. Um, irreducible and wonderful about uh, about Bengalis. Um, they love to chat. They love their food. They um, they're they're very funny. There's uh, values. Some some cultures um, value um, value hu humour, and some don't particularly. Um, Bengali is very much one of those. In the way that uh, the the English culture is, I think. So, I mean, the book is really about how the, um, you can throw all sorts of um, horrible things at the human spirit, and at the end of it, um, with a bit of luck, you know, we're still the, the same people in an essential way. What the one, one of the other things that um, just drove this book was just a, a visionary moment I had reading the newspaper and someone was writing a column about um, about the state of divorce in uh, in Britain and I think it said that uh, 
42% of all, um, all marriages in Britain now end in divorce. I thought 58% of English marriages, they go on for the whole of people's <laughs> lives. Isn't that wonderful? But no one ever says that. Mm -hmm. And that's what a wonderful thing. So I wanted to, I wanted to write a book about the way that in which um, nothing much can happen, but it's really wonderful at the end of it. Um, in the book, two, two of the aunts, I think, elope to get married. Yeah. Um, and one of the one of the uncles. Yeah. Um, and so, so how 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 were they with him being gay and then marrying you? Oh, what kind fine. of wedding did you have? Oh, they're fine. We had a great big wedding. Yeah. Yes, they. Because the weddings in the, the wedding at the end of the book is beautiful. Yes. I wonder, yes. Staff, I yeah. Anything. Yeah. No, they were they were fine. Yeah. Um, there's. Uh, um, uh, I mean, I've, I met. Um, I met Zav's parents. They they died um, three three or four years ago, um, but um, yes, it's it's people are people are resilient. People are very resilient. You know, you can throw surprising things at people and um, and they change. Uh, my husband's great grandfather um, married um, married uh, two women simultaneously. And then after that, they decided that they weren't going to do that anymore. And now, in our generation, we've decided that oh well, people can um, people can marry men. You know why not? Um, in in, the, in our culture, you know, a hundred years ago, um, it was con hun a bit more than a hundred years ago. It was considered absolutely outrageous that if your wife died, you should go on to marry her sister. Mm. You know, the nineteenth century thought that was an abomination. The what? church, you know. All these things change. People are very resilient about But I don't know if, does, if they always important. go in a forward direction. I mean, that's one of the interesting things that mm. happens is that Patrick has this moment in, in the book where he's fantasising about, about the ordinariness that, that might happen with two men living together mm. and that that might mm. just not be an exceptional thing, that, mm. that they could live together in, in, in safety. And now, and now, you know, now, we, now we have that. And then yet, mm. in the DACA that you described, there's... there's there's peace and people are getting on fine and everything's okay. And then there's great chaos and things seem to kind of go backwards. Um, and I, you know, I and I wonder if there's not a sense of that now a little bit with the with the gay marriage issue, um, mm. with the consultation on it, whether or not we're, you know, mm. whether it is going to go forward or not. Mm, mm, Do you mm. think? I, I, was, I was just thinking of something completely different, oh, which, was, which was just how positive Philip must be being at the moment, because it just sounds like <laughs> it just sounds like because you know. When you go on a creative writing course like I did, you get told a lot, only trouble is interesting, mm. you know, and, you know, you must have kind of conflict almost all the time. And what struck me, I mean, I've only managed to get halfway because I, you know, <laughs> I didn't have much time to read it, but, but I've, I've been loving it and I've been loving the way that actually, you know, we are so immersed in, in, in those lives and that's kind of enough, you know, and, 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 and the fact that, you know, that, that, that things like you say do go on. And, the you know, civil and people war that's survive. About to well, yeah, but but you know, it's but but even so, it's it's kind of it's very sort of celebratory. It seems to me, and and a kind of happy yeah. book. You know, yeah. I, mean, I haven't yeah. got to the end, but well, it's, it's <laughs> from what you're saying, yeah. it seems like it's a happy book, which I think is quite a brave yeah. thing to write in a way. Well, I think I think anything is interesting if you stop and look at it mm, yeah. long enough. Mm. Um, people say, <laughs> oh, look, there's a spider. Come in. Um, uh, look at it long enough. Look, if you look, yeah. well, no, I mean, yes, absolutely. Spiders, it's absolutely. Really fast. No, it's not. It's not. Did she bring it with her? She's <laughs> such a. She's such a. <laughs> is it Joanna's bitch, spider? <laughs> but um, no, I think that uh, I think that any life is um, is is simply gripping. I always think of um, of um, Arnold Bennett um, in, a, in a cafe seeing a. A very old woman come in, in in Paris, and everyone, all the waiters, laughing at her because she was dr so badly dressed, and just thinking, well, that woman, once she was in love, once she was beautiful, once she was, you know, and that was the old wives' tale. And the w old wives' tale is for me one of the great novels of the mm. century. And it, it's because someone's really stopped and looked at something which is very. Ordinary. One of the tasks that I give my creative writing students, I've, I've fallen into the terrible trap of teaching creative writing, and one of the things that I make them do, I make them go out and follow a stranger for two hours. <laughs> Stalking. They hate it. They absolutely hate it. Um, but, um, but if you follow anybody for two hours, it's very interesting. Who was, the, who was the artist? Was it Sophie Calley who followed 
before, who followed a man from the train station in Paris all the way back to Venice. That's the that's, yeah. that's where I got the idea from. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Can you imagine if at any point he just turned around and said, "Will you just leave me alone? You know, yeah. back off, lady." Well, they do actually. Yeah. I mean, yeah. my students have been told that. And once really? uh, and once a student followed somebody who turned out to be a drug dealer, which was rather frightening, but possibly convenient. Mm. Um, so I'll take questions from the audience. People have questions. Sure, you must have a couple. If you don't, oh, I can't see. Sorry. Oh, there's a mic. There. Sorry, I couldn't see you over there. Thank you. Um, firstly, Beth and I love the book. Um, it's very moving, very poignant. I really enjoyed it. So, two questions. Firstly, I'm I'm a Brighton resident as well. I love living in Brighton. Um, you've touched on Brighton already, but it feels very much another character in, in the book, um, both sort of accepting and rejecting. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about Brighton, what Brighton means to you, both as, as, as a person and as a writer. Secondly, um, you mentioned in, I think it's Daring Hearts, the, the Brighton Our Story project, um, the, the amazing bravery of, of, the, of that sort of early gay community in, in the city. Um, did you do any more research with, with people still living in Brighton about the times then, if you could say a bit more about that. Sure. What Brighton means to me. Um, yes. How long have you been there now? Um, I, um, yeah, about 17 years I think now. So I kind of think of it almost, well, I do think of it as my hometown. And I, I you know, I hope, I feel like a proper Brighton resident. Um, I think probably Brighton for me, you know, I mean, I, I kind of first uh, went there when I was about 15, 16 on a sort of day trip with a friend and it felt just like a very, um, you know, interesting and lively and exciting place to be. I grew up in a very small town called Abingdon, um, you know, which is kind of near Dickot Power Station <laughs> and, you know, where nothing ever happens really. And the most exciting thing on a Sunday is that, is, is that the supermarket lorry came into our street and it was open, you know, and you could buy a wham bar or something. But, you know, so, so I came to Brighton, it was like, you know, cafes, lights, culture you know it was very very exciting and I suppose you know for me I, I've, I found it quite hard to leave home because I'm you know quite a home girl and kind of you know very close to my family and Brighton really was kind of the reason why I left home you know and it, it sort of gave me a reason to leave I suppose so I think for me personally it's quite important um, and that whole thing of kind of you know d discovering another layer to my town was was fascinating to me um, in answer to, did I go and talk to anybody um, from the town about that time? The answer is is no. <laughs> um, and you know, I mean, there were sort of several reasons. I mean, one of them probably was that you know, I just I just kind of wanted to get on with writing and write my own book. And I felt that you know, with, with the stuff that I'd read had been so good that I kind of didn't need to. Um, but that's not to say that I'm, I'm not worried about what people in my own town who have lived through that period might think. So, but, but you know, so it's, that has been a kind of slight anxiety for me. But um, I've been very, very lucky in that I've had a couple of um, contacts from people saying, you know, that I, I kind of lived through that and, and, and I liked your book. So I feel very... Yeah. Relieved about that. They're not going to so, come after you. No, I hope not. Um, so you know, I hope I've done Brighton justice, really. When you when you were writing it, just did you have any kind of ambitions for it to be? Because I know you worked in television. Did you have any yeah. ambitions for it to be television drama? Because I can see it. It's very you know the characters you, walking do up and down the street. Don't want to make. Yes, on. yes, I do. <laughs> no, but you know, this bit that you know, all the, you're kind of ducking up and down lanes, and uh, it's just it feels. Well, Brighton's very filmic anyway, yeah. isn't it? You know, and. Um, I, I mean, I didn't. I wasn't thinking of that when mm. I was writing it. Absolutely not. But of course, I would love that. Yes, of course, no, of course, absolutely. That would be very nice. Um, I'll take another question. I still can't see you. Oh, lady at the front here. The microphone's coming. Thinking about writing comically and thinking about not not um, staging crisis and conflict all the way, which is a very lovely idea, but. It did make me wonder about King of the Badgers, <laughs> which is quite the opposite. And I, I just wanted to ask about that book as so dark. I mean, I found it did unbelievably. You? I know it has a, I don't want to spoil it, but, you know, it has got sort of a redemption at the end, but not for all no. of them, and particularly not for the character that I feel is the most 
invested, which is, I've forgotten his name, but you know, the David. character. That's it. The, yeah. the one that, you know, you're really made to live through, to me. I, I just wanted to know about <laughs> that, why, yeah. why that, that darkness and how that's changed in this one. Is it to do with no. the form, the relationship? Did you not think it was funny? <laughs> it was it was funny to a point, and then <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think for me, I just I found uh, it difficult to laugh at the uh, what happened to him. No, I don't know if anyone else has read it. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, um, it's quite an incredible read, but you know, I yes. it's, it just sounds so different in flavour. Yes, I mean, um, I, I get bored with uh, the idea of writing the same book, um, same book twice. Um, Drives my publisher up the wall because uh, they <laughs> they like they like um, you know Ivy Compton Burnett you know repeating <laughs> landlord and tenant you know so the, um, but I, I don't know I mean that was it, King of the Badgers was because um, I moved to a small town when um, in Devon during the week and um, I've never lived in small towns um, before and after I'd been there for a couple of months. Um, complete stranger came up to me in the street and said, did you enjoy your wild duck last night? <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinary. Because the butcher had said, that young man who's living in the Major General's house, he's, uh, he had wild duck, would you like... And I, I thought, actually, the means of... Um, uh, the, the social connections are, um, are, are kind of available for inspection here in a way that they aren't. I don't know, I didn't really think, am I going to write a dark book or a... Um, or a funny book. I, th I genuinely thought it was a really funny book. I <laughs> <laughs> not, th not where people not where people die violently, but um, but um, I don't know. I, I, yes, I don't think it's dark at all. I think it's quite quite sunny, and it ends with um, it ends with the gays feeding cheese to their dog Stanley. Didn't you even like Stanley? <laughs> Stanley, <laughs> has a, <laughs> Stanley has a happy ending. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. The, the the wild duck thing and the small voice sounds actually a lot like Brighton. And although as although as a city, people do know your business. Now I remember going to look at um, going to look at flats in Kemp Town um, and very quickly realising that I couldn't live there when I saw a neighbour going through another neighbour's rubbish <laughs> from from upstairs. And I thought, great, my recycling, my rubbish, it's all going to be gone through. So anyway, we are actually out of time. So I just want to say thank you to Philip and to Beth and, and to all of you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip and Beth. Okay, well, I, I just want to add my thanks. It was uh, very fascinating to see um, Bangladesh and Brighton combined and some <laughs> of the convergences. Um, and, you know, as Damien pointed out, um, the, the, the other link, I suppose, in the book is the fact that yours was based on an, uh, um, uh, uh, real characters, but you, you'd never encountered them. You uh, had to uh, recreate them. Whereas uh, um, Philip's, and you do call it a novel, um, uh, Philip's novel um, is obviously based on his sort of intimate relationship with somebody he's known very well, um, who's led a very different life to his own, um, which, which, which is always very uh, uh, fascinating. Um, I've, I did forget to mention at the beginning that Philip um, does, uh, you profess of creative writing in uh, Exeter. I, I try and keep it quiet. Okay, so he tries <laughs> to keep it quiet. Uh, um, but, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he does teach creative writing at, at uh, Exeter. So um, we'll give them one more round of applause and then we... What, what